And thank you for joining us today for this important discussion on the public health co-benefits of air quality and climate policy actions. I'm Jen Perrin with the California China Climate Institute and will be the moderator for today's discussion. Before we begin, I'd like to offer a few quick housekeeping remarks. First, we are recording this discussion, which will later be available on the California China Climate Institute website and YouTube channels. This event is being simultaneously translated into Mandarin Chinese. You can click on the globe icon at the base of your screen to select the language that you would like to listen in, either English or Mandarin. Throughout today's discussion, uh, if you would like to ask a question, please paste it in the Q&A function also found at the base of your screen. We will have time for audience question and answers toward the end of our program, and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can live. Now, let's begin today's discussion. So air pollution and climate change are deeply linked issues with overlapping solution sets and quite significant implications for public health. The connection between the two really demands a cohesive policy approach to maximizing co-benefits, especially for health. Both California and China have made significant strides in addressing air quality and climate concerns in recent years. California, in particular, has integrated public health considerations into its air quality and climate policies whereas China has really focused on combating air quality and greenhouse gas emissions concurrently through dual emissions control policies. And China has also recently released a new national air quality action plan. Today, we're here to share some key findings from a new California China Climate Institute report that examines best practices and lessons learned, as well as key policy and technological examples from both California and China aimed at maximizing public health co-benefits. You can find the links to the English and Mandarin versions of the report, as well as the summary for policymakers on our website at the link found in uh, the chat. So to begin, um, my colleague Vishen Zhu, also of the California China Climate Institute and a co-author of the report is going to discuss some of the key report findings and highlights. I'll turn it over to you, Vishen. Um, thanks, Jen. Uh, let me share my screen first. Um... Okay, thanks, Jen, uh, for introducing uh, the project. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Rishin Zhu, the Methane Policy Fellow at the California China Climate Institute. Today, it's my pleasure to share uh, CCCI's latest report about public health dimension, uh, public health co benefits of air quality and climate change. Um, this report is mainly focused on uh, the benefits of different policies. So let's dig in. So before we begin, I would like to give you a brief explanation of why we want to do this research. Um, so nowadays, um, air, 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 climate, and health, these three pillars are very closely related, uh, as you can see in this diagram. Um, so for example, greenhouse gases and air pollution are generated together and therefore can be mitigated together. And as we all know, uh, both air pollution and uh, climate change can lead to uh, diseases, economic hardship, and loss of life. Um, so because these three pillars are um, closely related to each other, it is very important to integrate these three pillars in our air and climate policies. So that's why we want to do this research to figure out how can air and climate policies benefit health how should we estimate the public the public health benefits of air and climate policies? And how should we implement policies that integrates these three pillars? Uh, there are so to to achieve the goal I just mentioned, uh, we did three major things in our report. So first is that we explore the policy measures to integrate climate, air, and health in both California and China. And we find out some. Uh, we we find out what policies are currently be 
implemented and, and what challenges exist in current policies in both California and China. The second thing we did is to identify some indicators for public health co-benefits evaluations. And we summarized a, a table and diagram of indicators that can be used by other uh, by, by governments in other local jurisdictions. Finally, we uh, did some we conduct some case studies uh, for cities and counties in both China and California, namely Beijing, Shenzhen, and the Los Angeles County. Uh, we conduct this uh, case study to find out how local cities and counties uh, implement uh, policies that integrate these three pillars uh, and what policies and techno technological options are available now. So these are three things that we did, uh, three major things we did in this report. So first of all, I would like to uh, briefly introduce what policies and challenges exist in, in California and China. Um, so first of all, for California, uh, California is the leaders in air quality and climate policies. And, uh, and California has uh, been facing severe uh, air pollution problems uh, for several years. Um, so uh, right now, California has already integrated um, three pillars, air, climate, and health in its policies and in very, uh, and has taken uh, many health-focused approach to you know, implement these policies. For China, um, China is similar to California. Uh, it achieved a remarkable results in air pollution control and climate change mitigation. Uh, China, China is also facing air and climate issues. Uh, for example, in some regions in China, there are, that, that, that there are still very um, serious problem of air pollution. Um, and we also see a change of uh, policy directions in China. Uh, for example, the concepts of coordinated control and public health impacts are both emphasized in uh, national and subnational five-year plans. So this uh, means that China has an, has an intent to integrate um, climate, air, and public health in its policies. So this is so these slides provide a brief introduction to the current policies in California and China. And next, I would like to talk about um, you know some differences between California and China and what challenges um, in are there in these two uh, jurisdictions. So first of all, for California, uh, some California policies has already integrated the three pillars, as I just mentioned, and California is uh, paying greater attention to how communities disproportionately bear health burdens. Um, this is related to environmental equity issues. California has also devised many indicators um, to measure public health co-benefits of, of its air and climate policies, uh, which is very advanced. One problem that still exists in California is that uh, the public health indicators of many policies often differ, which make it hard sometimes to measure the public health effectiveness uh, across different uh, air and climate policies. Yeah. And in China, uh, as I just mentioned, uh, there's a change of policy, a change of trend in policies. Uh, so specifically, uh, there are well-recognized synergies between air pollution and climate, as well as air pollution and health in China's policies. China has also made some progress in conducting public health impact research. Uh, for example, some provinces in China, such as Guangdong, already conducted uh, localized public health impact assessments of climate change and air pollution. Um, however, there's the, the, the number of such uh, research is still small. So in that so in that case, we still need more uh, research like that and we still need uh, standardized assessment guidelines for China. Uh, one other challenges in China is that there is still a lack of public health targets in China's climate policies. Uh, I mean uh, by, by this I mean those explicit public health, uh, indicators such as mortality or morbidity. Uh, so to solve this problem, uh, one way is to include public health indicators or targets in their upper level uh, government policies such as national and or provincial uh, policies. So, 
So this is a brief uh, introduction to the current the status the status quo in both California and, and China. Next, I would like to uh, briefly introduce the indicators that we summarize in this report that could be used by other jurisdictions to estimate uh, public health co-benefits of their air and climate policies. So as you can see in this diagram, um, these indicators can be divided into three major categories, mortality, morbidity, and other. Um, these other categories, uh, uh, most of the time it means uh, economic indicators. Um, this is because climate change and air pollution can impact the time that people can devote it into work and production. Um, so if there is climate, if, if some problem is caused by climate change and air pollution, uh, there, there, there will be economic loss. So this, so this diagram explain how we, you know, uh, how we categorize different uh, indicators of public health. Uh, but it should also be noted that there are still some gaps uh, in these indicators and, and in scientific research about public health benefits assessment. Uh, for example, there is always a problem of inaccurate measurements of these indicators. Uh, and there's also a lack of long-term exposure data. Uh, by long-term exposure data, uh, what I mean is um, the co-exposure to both uh, climate climate change and air pollution at the same time. Uh, the, the public health impact of such co-exposure is still unclear uh, in scientific research. So more work needs to be done to, to get to gain a better understanding of uh, the impact of the public health impacts of co-exposure. Uh, finally, there is limited understanding of um of law, uh, yeah, of co-exposure, as I just mentioned. Sorry. Um, so uh, now I would like to introduce the case study that we did um, th that we did uh, for the LA County and Beijing and Shenzhen. Um, so first of all, for LA County, for, for those who are not that familiar with LA County, I'd like to give you a brief introduction of the background and actions that LA County has conducted. So LA County is a pioneer of air pollution, air pollution control and has ambitious climate targets. Uh, public health is a very important motivation for air quality policies. So that's why LA County has devised a comprehensive evaluation methodology um, and also many public health indicators to measure the public health co-benefits of its uh, climate and air policies. Uh, LA County has done a lot to, to, to achieve the public health benefits. Um, Policies, po examples of policies include the South, the, the air quality man management plan of the South Coast Air Quality Management District, uh, our county plan, Green New Deal, uh, etc. Uh, LA County also uses different decision making tools, uh, such as predicting what predicting what we breathe and Cal Enviro Screen. So these tools and these policies are all great examples for other jurisdictions to learn. Um, we have three major findings from LA County. Um, so first, uh, first uh, jurisdictions should engage in scientific research to ensure policies are informed by uh, public health co-benefits. Uh, second, health co-benefit can serve as measurable quantitative goals if granular data is available. So uh, in other words, granular data is very important to you know, accurately measure health co-benefits of climate and air policies. And that raised the questions for, um, for how to improve the current monitoring system and data collection system. Finally, uh, expected health co-benefits can be incorporated in the policy to gain better buy-in and to ensure the policy is beneficial for target audiences. So this is a brief introduction to the LA uh, County's case study. And for uh, cities in China, we pick Beijing and Shenzhen. Uh, the reason why we pick these two cities um, are the, uh, uh, is because these cities are very similar to each other. So for example, they both made great success in air quality improvement um, as a big city. Uh, and they also make significant progress in carbon neutrality through various approaches. Um, also, for both cities, public health is an important motivation for air quality policies. Um, and also, both cities don't have uh, explicit public health indicators in their policies, such as mortality or morbidity indicators. Uh, most 
public health related indicators in these two cities are about uh, the concentration of air pollutants and energy consumption and forest coverage. So given the similarity of these two cities, we did case study um, for both of the cities. And uh, actually the actions conducted by these cities are also similar in, to some extent. Uh, for example, they both have stringent local standards for air quality. They did a lot to adjust the structure of industry, uh, industry, energy, transportation, and buildings. Um, and what is unique, uh, and they both have carbon markets. Um, what is unique about Beijing is that it's a pioneer of the concept of coordinated control. Um, actually, coordinated, coordinated control have three layers of meaning. Um, one is the, the control of PM 2.5 and ozone at the same time. The second is the control of both greenhouse gases and air pollutants. And finally, uh, the control of uh, air pollution from city, from different cities in the same region. So Beijing is a pioneer of this, con uh, of this concept um, and it keeps implementing it, which enables Beijing to make great achievement, uh, to make great improvement in air quality in past 10 years. Uh, what is unique to Shenzhen, by the way, is that it's the first city in China to conduct air pollu pollution and greenhouse gases sources analysis. Uh, it also have conducted public health impact evaluation um, evaluation for both air pollution and, and climate change. There are four major findings uh, we conclude from the case study of uh, in Beijing and Shenzhen. First of all, there is a lack of explicit public health indicators, uh, as I mentioned before. Second, regional efforts are very important. Uh, you know, both cities has conduct uh, their air pollution and climate change policies uh, and collaborates with cities around them to, you know, to either help this help the cities around them to improve their air quality, or uh, or share their lessons with other cities how they uh, about how to achieve decarbonization. Uh, the third finding is that national and provincial level policies should include public health targets to encourage local actions. Uh, many interviewees um, uh, of this report agree with these uh, findings. Finally, coordinated control and carbon markets are very effective and should be further implemented uh, in other areas in China. So after all this, uh, I would like to give you some uh, take home message um, that you should uh, that you, 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 you can learn from this uh, report. So first, uh, indicators in policies should be regular, regularly up, upgraded. Um, and second, California has already has a relatively robust policy portfolio that include public health indicators. And it has also demonstrated that public health co-benefits can serve as a measurable quantitative, quantitative goals. Uh, in China, uh, we noticed that public health co-benefits uh, of air policies are well recognized, but this is less true uh, for the public health co-benefits of climate change policies. Um, so, so in that way, China has to do more to evaluate the public health impacts of climate policies. Um, but China did uh, do a great job in monitoring and improving air quality. So other jurisdictions can absolutely learn something uh, from China about how to install monitoring system and uh, or improve air quality. Finally, uh, we have some suggestions about uh, future actions to you know better uh, better address the public health co benefits of uh, climate and air policies. Uh, the most important thing is to share lessons learned uh, in, you know, in both jurisdictions. Uh, second, it is important to utilize and expand, expand upon the use of techno technological monitoring and mapping tools. Uh, we should also try to further implement coordinated control and regional approaches in both California and China. And we should also conduct more localized public health research because this is important um, you know, to to estimate the, the public health impacts of air and climate policies in different region, uh, because different region has has different situations. Um, uh, next, uh, fostering multi stakeholders engagement uh, is a good way in driving public health actions. Uh, China is a good example actually because China uh, made great achievement in improving air quality because 
people in China realize how bad the air quality is, um, and they force their government, and 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 that created a trend, uh, and that creates a trend of public opinions, which forced the government to take action. Finally, it is important to include public health targets in upper level policies, such as national and state level policies, especially in China, to drive more local actions. So this is it. This is a brief, a very brief uh, introduction to this report. Uh, thank you so much for listening. If you are interested in reading more about this report, you can go to this hyperlink. Uh, there are many, many more details there. Uh, we also have a Chinese version of the whole report and as well as the summary for policymakers if you uh, prefer Chinese version. Um, so yeah, that's it. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Thank you for all the interviewees and reviewers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rishen. Next, uh, we're going to turn to some examples from some key urban um, regions in both California and China to, to learn a little bit more. So I will first introduce our next two speakers and then we'll hear from them in sequence. So first we'll hear from Ms. Han Yuhua, Chief of the Division of, on Policy Development with the Beijing Municipal Research Academy for Ecology and Environment. And then following her remarks, we will hear from Dr. Sarah Rees, Assistant Deputy Executive Officer at the South Coast Air Quality Management District. So we'll start with you, Ms. Han. And Yes, we can hear you.首先感谢主持人的介绍也很高兴能参加今天的交流活动也从法规和规划的一些制定的多个方面提出要求推动这些政策的落地实施北京市的大气污染防治条例就是这个法规的出台呢对于降低这个细颗粒物对公众健康的影响是发挥了一个重要的作用就是来应对就是空气污染对健康的公众健康的影响还是有一个很重要的一个作用的
但是呢，它的措施其实是在全国是有很大的示范意义的，就特别是呃建设了四大燃煤燃煤的那个热电厂来替代了燃煤电厂，呃那个燃那个建设了四大燃气的热电厂来替代燃煤的电厂，呃同时呢也持续开展了燃煤锅炉的清洁能源化的改造。呃，包括我们就是生那个居民的这种燃直接燃煤的这种煤改煤改那个电，它的一些那个采暖的煤改电的措施，包包括那个积极推广新能源车和加快淘汰高排放车等等这些措施吧，其实都是从跟公众身边的这些直接相关的这些污染的污染源那那个来入手，呃，来推这些措施的实施呢，不仅有效了减少了汽颗粒物的排放，也协同削减了温室气体的排放。嗯，特别是公众健康的效应也是比较明显的。嗯，第二个呢是在那个应对气候变化方面，也是从减缓和适应气候变化两个方面来着手。呃，那个报告中其实也提到了北京，它除了这个协同的一些减排效应、协同的减排以外啊，就是这个呃，就是第一个就是大气污染物和温室气体的协同这个领域，特别比较重要的一些措施，特别是就是一些源头管控的措施，包括能源结构的调整、产业结构的呃那个。的优化以及交通交通结构的一些绿色化的政策吧，来协同实现了显著的一个降碳效果，这个是一个很很明显的一个一个措施。同时呢，就是在二零一六年发布的《北京市“十三五”时期节能降耗及应对气候变化的规划中，也提到了碳排放总量的控制，以及提高呃气候变化适应能力的目标，以及呃也也要求来也提出了加强极端气候事件。可能蔓延的疾病流行规律及物及防治的研究，也嗯要求开展气候变化对人体健康影响的知识普及教育等等，嗯，这个是一些要求层面的内容，嗯，同时呢，二零一七呃应该是二零一七年也发布了，呃，这是国家批准的北京城市总体规划，嗯，二零一六年到二零三五年也提出了对于城市，呃，城市适应气候变化的一些要求。呃，包括那个基础设施的适应能力、城市系统的碳呃那个碳汇能力的提升，以及增强极端气候事件的应急能力，呃，也要求将北京建设成为气候智慧型的示范城市。嗯，这些呢都是在就是规划层面对于呃那个适应呃减缓和适应气候变化的一些一些那个补充性的要求吧。呃，当然也那个其实报告中也提到了北京市“十四五”时期生态环境保护规划的一些目标方面的要求。呃，其实，在那个措施层面呢，其实也提到了适应气候变化能力的具体要求，包括开展气候变化影响及风险评估，在城市规划设计和建设中要充分考虑极端天天气条件等等吧。这些呃，就是规划层面的要求呢，呃，那个也是对于降低因气候变化呃带来的公共健康风险具有重要作用。嗯，当然，可能报告中也提到了对于我们大气。和气候变化方面的一些成效啊，这里我们就不再说了，这只是一个补充性的发言。感谢主持人。Thank you for your remarks. Dr. Rees, we will turn to you. Great, thank you so much. So I'm going to share my screen. So I have a few slides that I would like to uh, run through and here we go. Okay, great. So, um, you know, good morning, my esteemed colleagues in China, and then to my esteemed colleagues, good afternoon in, or evening in the U.S. My name is Sarah Reese. I'm the Deputy Executive Officer for Planning at the South Coast Air Quality Management District, and I'm going to talk today a little bit about some of the challenges that we face in Southern California and what those resulting health impacts are as a result of air pollution. So first, just go over quickly our challenge. So the South Coast Air Quality Management District is the local government agency responsible for air quality in the Greater Los Angeles region. This is an area that has historically had the worst air quality by far in the U.S. We have made great strides in cutting emissions by over fifty percent in the last、uh, two decades, but we still suffer from the worst air quality in the country, and so still have a long way to go. 
In terms of our regulatory requirements, we are required by national law to meet health-based ambient air quality standards. These are standards that the US EPA sets uh, every five years. Um, for us, the most important ones are ozone and particulate matter. The good news here is a lot of the same strategies that we need to take to be able to reduce ozone and particulate matter levels will also reduce greenhouse gas emissions. As a local uh, government agency for air quality, our focus is on those criteria pollutants, not on greenhouse gases, but we do understand the importance for decarbonization, especially the goals that California has in place and needing to make sure everything works in concert to, to help that happen. We also need to address air toxics. So we have a lot of industry in our region that emits metals, um, different um, organic carbon compounds, as well as diesel particulate matter from engines and heavy duty mobile sources. Um, so we need to take actions to reduce those as well. And then all of these actions, when you add them up, result in substantial health benefits. In 2022, we developed our most recent air quality management plan. Uh, this is our strategy as to how we're going to meet the most recent ozone standard that the US EPA has set for the US. Um, so this is just our blueprint with all the strategies and control measures that we have in place. Um, the deadline for meeting that standard is in 2037, which seems far out. But as you will see, we have a lot of work we need to do and some pretty uh, stringent requirements we need to put in place in order to meet that. So oxides of nitrogen or NOx, that's the key pollutant that we need to control in order to reduce both ozone and particulate matter levels in our region. Um, ozone is formed from the reaction of NOx and volatile organic compounds, but in our area, NOx is really the dominant chemical that controls that reaction. Uh, NOx is formed as a byproduct of combustion, and we have a lot of combustion in our region, a lot of engines from transportation. We have the largest port complex in the U.S., um, a lot of goods movement and logistics with that, as well as industry. Uh, from this chart here, you can see that there's some good news in that we're reducing NOx fairly substantially just by the existing regulations that we have on the books. So in 2018, which is our baseline year, uh, NOx was at 351 tons per day. Just with the existing rules that we have in place, that will go down to 184 ton per day by 2037, which is the deadline. The problem is, is that our models show that we need we can have no more than 60 ton per day in the atmosphere in order to be able to meet the ozone standard. So that means we have to take a, a lot more steps to get radical reductions in NOx beyond what we already have in place. And what this means is we really have to deviate from approaches that we've used in the past, those traditional air pollution controls on, you know, tailpipe uh, controls or exhaust stack controls. They're really not going to be enough to, to get the reductions we need. We've already taken a lot of these steps in place and have very stringent regulations in place. So now we need to pivot and, and, and really embrace advanced technologies and look to uh, zero emission technologies across all sectors wherever it is feasible. Um, the good news again there is a lot of these steps are needed to decarbonize the economy and make uh, climate goals. Um, and then it'll also continue to reduce uh, toxic diesel pollution, which impacts our communities. So we get multiple benefits from adopting these strategies. As a local air agency, our regulatory authority is strongest on stationary sources. Um, from NOx emissions, about 80% of that is coming from mobile sources, and those are more subject to the regulations of uh, the state of California, as well as the federal government. But we work closely to develop strategies on all of those fronts with, but with uh, California. But so for stationary sources, it's important, even though they're not um, a big, uh, as big a con contributor to NOx, it's very important that we take reductions wherever we can. And so for residential buildings and commercial buildings, looking at where we can move away from combustion in those facilities. So combustion for water heating or space heating or even for cooking, moving away from gas combustion, looking at uh, electrification, um, perhaps heat pump technology for heating, 
using perhaps some fuel cell technology. Similarly, for industrial sources, for large process boilers, for high temperature heating applications, seeing if there's a fuel uh, cell or heat pump uh, uh, ways in which we can uh, address that and then switch to zero emission technologies. I mentioned as a local air authority, we don't have a direct regulatory authority for mobile sources, but we do have some authority. And so we have some measures that we've developed to address that. We can't directly regulate emissions from aircraft or from trucks or from ships or, or, or trains, but we can regulate and put requirements on airports or on um, rail yards or on warehouses. And so we're developing some rules to do that, which will encourage zero emission and cleaner engines um, as part of the fleets that visit these facilities. Um, for uh, construction, looking to see if we can establish some regulations to require the cleanest possible construction equipment to be used. And then we're also looking at some opportunities for international collaboration for um, our vessel programs. So ships are a huge contributor to NOx. And so wanting to partner with other Pacific Rim nations to see if there's some joint incentive programs we can put together to make sure we get the cleanest vessels calling at all of our ports. And then I mentioned the role of the state of California. California is developing some very advanced regulation um, on trucks to mandate zero emission trucks moving on into the future, um, as well as the uh, interim milestones for cleanest technologies. On off-road equipment, looking at the cleanest possible engine tiers and putting that in place. And then on uh, ships, committing to working with the U.S. government um, and on the international level to see if we can get um, uh, cleaner engine standards for ships in the future. And when we add up all of these strategies that we put in place, at the end of the day, um, there's very, very significant health benefits that result from this. We do comprehensive modeling to be able to monetize the health benefits. Um, and if we're able to realize our goals, we'll get $19.4 billion every year in health benefits as a result of these strategies. Most of this is from avoided premature death, um, and that is associated with fine particulate matter. And we estimate we'll have uh, approximately 1,500 fewer premature deaths every year as a result of instituting these strategies, as well as a whole variety of other health benefits ranging from fewer asthma cases, less hospitalizations, less lost work days due to sickness, et cetera. So that's, that's my presentation. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions and look forward to future discussion. Thank you, Dr. Rees and Ms. Han for your remarks and sharing some of these localized examples. Uh, we'll soon turn to audience question and answer. So if you do have questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A um, field at the base of your screen. We'll get to them shortly. But before we do, uh, we'd like to have some commentary from uh, another issue expert in this field, uh, professor and senior associate dean for academic programs at UCLA, Professor Yifang Zhu, um, is with us today and has done extensive research in this field. So we'd, we'd love to hear your comments and insights from, from your own research as well. Thank you. Good evening and good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to review the report and to share uh, some of my thoughts. Uh, first of all, I would like to really thank um, the authors for putting together such a comprehensive report. Uh, I particularly appreciate their efforts to uh, highlight the synergies between climate change, air quality, and the public health, and as well as their emphasize on uh, how these factors could impact policy development. Uh, I also very much value the insightful case studies uh, included in the report and the identified opportunities for collaboration between California and China in those areas. So today, um, for the interest of time, I would just like to highlight three aspects of the report that resonate most with me and including some of my ongoing works. Uh, first, the synergy between climate change, air quality, and public health. Um, as the report clearly lay out, it is very important to recognize that air pollution and climate change, they are not isolated challenges. Uh, they're deeply interconnected issues, each substantially impacting the public health, 
So policies that are targeting greenhouse gas emissions will also address climate change, both climate change and uh, bring health benefits. Like for example, as Sarah mentioned, if we can reduce those emissions in um, Southern California, then that will lower, that will reduce the air pollution levels, which will translate into a uh, lower rates of respiratory and cardiovascular diseases, right? So those are well linked to uh, poor air quality in the literature. So the co-benefits of addressing those issues are very profound, uh, especially for vulnerable populations. Um, those effective air and climate policies, they have the potential to substantially reduce global mortality and morbidity rate. And those benefits are not just for health, um, there's also tangible economic impact as well. Sarah showed you some of those numbers. Uh, when we improve public health outcomes, that will really translate to lower healthcare costs and increased productivity besides those avoided mortality and morbidity that is highlighted in the literature and in the report. And both California and China have already seen those economic benefits firsthand. So the sec second point I want to uh, emphasize is about the best practice and environmental justice in California and China. Uh, California has been at the forefront integrating public health into its air and climate policies as uh, Sinjo already shared with you in the report uh, overview. This integration, especially focusing on disadvantaged communities populations has led to more equitable and effective solutions for both climate and air quality. Uh, similarly, China's effort in mitigating air pollution, the greenhouse gases are also very commendable. I'm really impressed by how much uh, the government and the local and the federal government and many colleagues work together to bring the PM 2.5 levels down uh, such quickly over a short period of time. And cities like Los Angeles, Beijing, and Shenzhen, they offer real-world examples of how integrating public health indicators into policy can lead to more informed decision makings. I think this is a very important aspect for us to keep in mind, and I think the report summarized that very well. And for both California and China, I, in my view, uh, equity must be at the heart of uh, climate change mitigation strategies, especially during the current unprecedented uh, energy transition that both regions are going through. It is very important that the benefits of uh, clean energy and improved air quality reach all communities, uh, particularly those historically disadvantaged. So this would involve a strategic infrastructure planning to ensure a healthy and more equitable energy transition, such as, for example, making new technologies like EV charging stations accessible to everyone. Finally, I think there's lots of opportunities, um, tremendous opportunities actually for uh, California and China to exchange, to increase those exchange collaborations between the two regions uh, to allow them to share best practice, uh, technolo technological advancement, and policy frameworks um, that could work together to enhance the effectiveness of uh, their efforts in um, meeting climate change and improving air quality and protecting public health. Uh, in addition, supporting localized uh, public health research and involving various stakeholders can also drive more impactful actions for both uh, jurisdictions. So overall, I think prioritizing public health in air and climate policy making is not just beneficial, but it's uh, imperative for a sustainable and equ equitable global progress. Uh, by learning from each other's experiences and continuously to refine our approach, I think we can uh, cultivate healthier communities and a more resilient population in both countries. Uh, so I expect such collaboration between California and China will lead to uh, innovative solutions for climate, air, and health. Uh, thank you so much for today's um, uh, presentation. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much, Professor Zhu. So next we're going to turn to audience question and answer. So please do um, type your questions into the Q&A field at the base of your screen. Um, perhaps we'll start with a question for Dr. Rees, you know, kind of picking up where you left off with that last slide that 
um, you know, quantified and monetized the public health benefits of policy actions. I'm curious to know a little bit more about, you know, how that kind of quantification exercise helps inform future policy development or how it helps you communicate to public audiences about, you know, the importance of, of policy action. I'm curious kind of how, how that, um, monetization and quantification of, of the co-benefits um, is useful to you in your work? Thank you. That's a, that's a great question. And uh, I should mention as background before I came to the district, I worked for US EPA. And that's one of the things that I worked on was monetizing benefits associated with national uh, uh, regulations. I think it's really important because it helps provide context. A lot of these strategies and these rules that we put in place are very expensive. And I think it's very important for people to understand the very real costs associated with air pollution and the tangible benefits that we get out of it. You know, when we can model you fairly accurately the number of premature deaths that we're going to avoid, there's a tremendous value for that, not just for the individuals who would be spared, but for the, you know, that has signals throughout the whole economy. And so there's, you know, um, it, it's a tremendous benefit and it helps, I think, just provide that perspective when you have concerns about the economic costs of regulation and what that looks like. Thanks so much for that. Um, perhaps a question uh, for Ms. Han uh, about the context in Beijing. Um, so Beijing has put really considerable focus on air quality monitoring um, and has had great success in, in large scale monitoring uh, technology approaches. So I'm curious, you know, what lessons can be drawn from that experience and, and how how might that, you know, influence an approach to public health? Thank you. 对于北京来说那个其实北京的体量是比较大的然后北京最近几年呢其实主要在大气方面那个是从主要是从大气这里的一些角度吧开展了很多说有成效的成果特别是针对自公众身边的一些污染的问题我觉得就包括就是对于我
I mean, if, if you take a look in our report, we have uh, we have some appendix and those appendix are really, really long because they encompass basically all the indicators that California has been using um, to estimate public health co-benefits. Uh, now, I mean, under those three categories I mentioned before, uh, mortality, morbidity, and others, uh, there are, I, I, I don't know, like 20, 30 something indicators that they use, uh, all are very detailed and directly related to public health um, and diseases, something like that. Um, on the other hand, in China, I think, uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, um, th there is very little like explicit public health indicators uh, in, in China's policies. Like uh, so, if you take a look in in China's five year plan, if you take a look at the um, provincial action plan, something like that, they don't they don't have um, public health indicators such as mortality or morbidity. They do have some indicators that is related. Uh, for example, they for example Beijing and Shenzhen have uh you know have set targets for re reducing concentration of PM two point five. This is kind of related to public health, uh, but they won't say something like, oh, we want to reduce the asthma rate to a certain percentage uh, in their, you know, in, in, in their policies. Uh, I mean, th th there's a lot of reasons behind uh, these differences. Uh, I mean, especially for China, uh, I know China tends to be more uh, conservative in conservative in setting the, their target because uh, I'm, because if 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 there are some targets in China's policies, they are going to achieve that. Um, so so because and, and because right now there's still a lack of localized public health uh, impact research in China. Uh, I think uh, maybe the governments are not that prepared to to include those those indicators in in their policies like what California did. But I be but I do believe. Um, Given that much, given that many more public health research will be conducted in the future, there, there's, there's more like that. There's more likely a chance to, you know, for for those public health indicators to appear in in China's, uh, policy documents. Yeah. So that's my thoughts. Thanks so much, Rishen. Uh, that leads me to another question for Ms. Han. Um, so earlier this month, uh, a new national air quality. Apologies. Um, earlier this month, a new national air quality action plan was released in China. I'm curious to know, um, you know, how you think that that new plan might help inform Beijing's next steps. You know, as you stated in your remarks earlier, you know, Beijing in the past has has been able to exceed, you know, national level targets. Um, but, you know, kind of talking a little bit about the role of, you know, national plans versus municipality plans.嗯,那个感谢主持人啊,其实我也是关注到了我们国家最新发布的这个这个计划,嗯,然后呢,嗯,就是就是北京市呢,因为按照要求的话,应该是要变要那个来来落实这个国家的要求,呃,但是呢,
，我的发言就是这些。谢谢主持人。Thank you. And perhaps another for Dr. Rees. Um, so in recent months, the South Coast Air Quality Management District has been working on enforcement of uh, a rule to reduce emissions from warehouses, particularly in disadvantaged communities. You talked a lot about nitrogen oxides being a really important pollutant um, and having some, you know, disparate impacts on vulnerable communities, you know, living in proximate proximate to polluting sources. Um, so I'm curious if there are any updates that you can share about that, that those enforcement efforts to reduce emissions from warehouses. Sure, yeah, we're we're very proud of that rule. It was the first of its kind on warehousing, which is becoming a huge issue, not only in Southern California, but in a lot of other areas where you get concentrations of warehouses, um, a lot of truck traffic that comes in associated with that, a lot of other equipment that also emits diesel, um, and it can uh, you know really impact the communities that live close to them. Um, so we've been, uh, th this rule was uh, adopted in, uh, 20, uh, 2021, so relatively recently uh, passed, and we've been implementing this uh, relatively slowly. But uh, one of the results that we've been seeing is that when we put the rule together, there were a lot of concerns that it would drive the warehouse industry out of business, that they would pick up and move away from California. They would just go across the border to another state where they didn't have that regulation. And we've not seen that happen at all. We've seen warehousing, the uh, the, it, the the business is booming. It's um, going even better than it ever has before. Um, we are seeing uh, uh, some compliance issues. So we are investigating that and we are working with the industry right now to make sure that um, people are aware of the rule because that's one of the problems is that a lot of these warehouses, they may not be aware that there's a requirement in place. They don't have to get air permits. They don't interact with us as an agency on a regular basis. And so a lot of the work we've been doing is to be outreach to those industries, make sure that they're aware of the requirements. We provide support in helping them comply, and we're confident that we're going to get to see uh, more results from this rule. Great. Thank you so much. Perhaps, uh, Professor Ju, perhaps, uh, you know, you've done a lot of research in this space. Um, would love to hear your reflections. Um, you, you talked about some priority areas in your remarks earlier, but um, your reflections about any research gaps or, you know, where where there's, you know, we need to do additional research um, to support efforts in this space. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think um, there are, um, there's always like research needs. I think at uh, different levels, we can think about um, potential gaps. Like for example, one thing that I, I noticed, this is true actually both in, um, in California and in uh, in China is when we try to better link uh, climate and air pollution together. Yeah, the emission inventory are actually done by different groups um, for different, uh, using different methodologies and presented in a very quite different ways. So, so there's just lots of efforts needs to be um, like go into it to um, match those uh, uh, emissions, even at, you know, they, they just call different uh, industries, group them into different categories. So this is actually quite a, a, a issue. If, you know, for some if we want to do more um, uh, like coordinated research, looking at both greenhouse gas emissions and air pollutant emissions, there's actually two different uh, systems. So I think lots of those, um, uh, you know, you might call it gaps or challenges are related to just, you know, even though people here like, you know, understand there are like, um, Air, air pollution and climate change, they are closely linked, but the field actually developed by, you know, more or less different people. There are some people are working on both sides, but there's a lot you know, more people just working on the climate science side and air pollution science side. And there's, I think, more connections to bring people together to talk about those two side by side, um, you know, like, a, like a, you know, in a form like this, SB will be really helpful. And also similarly by the regulations like California, I see here, say, say similar thing. As Sarah mentioned, and there's different uh, jurisdictions over different sources. And when it comes to greenhouse gases and air pollution, there's different um, you know, entities that, that has the regulatory authorities. 
right, to, you know, even in, even in California. So how who should owns that, uh, who should who should take the responsibility to really uh, put those two like together and, and think about um the, the you know the goals the climate decarbonization people may always just think oh I need to get bring down the carbon intensities and all of that right so the air pollution may say oh we're at PM two point five needs to meet certain levels but they all actually can come together and and now we bring in the the health indicators right so should, are we are we trying to say oh we should really uh um, make sure the asthma rates, asthma incidence, and gas that he certain. But there's a very complicated, right? It's not just uh, air pollution. There's many other things. I think the indicator, the public health indicator, you know, in my view, is more like a, like a Sarah said, used as a way to quantify the impact of your climate and air pollution actions and policies and translate it into something that is more tangible and is more localized for policymakers to motivate. Right to to get better buy-ins uh, as as uh, as easy said. So I think those are things, and there's definitely um more um research opportunities to do that. And then all all in all of that, so the, the analysis right now is still pretty much done at um fairly uh, sort of like uh, you know especially I think there's lots of work have done trying to zoom in to more localized um communities, but on the time space there's actually. Uh, annual based average are still uh, pretty much dominant in the literature. If we can get more like uh, um, fine, high, high resolution time temporal data or analysis, uh, that that's, I think I can provide more like, um, I guess, immediate actions for, for those for both. So I think there's definitely a lot of room to, um, to do more work in this space. Great. And this next question, I think, you know, can open up to everyone, but maybe I'll put um, Ask Rishin's, uh perspectives initially. Um, you know, so what, what do you see as some of the most interesting best practices that emerged from this research related to California and China's actions? You know, what are some approaches that might be useful to other jurisdictions, um, you know, the report, you know, highlights some, but um, would love to hear from from anyone on the call. Perhaps starting with Rishin. Yeah, I should have mentioned that we actually have a section in our report that is specifically about uh, what technological tools are being uh, used in both uh, California and China. Uh, I will give some examples of best best practices that I think uh, is useful. Uh, for example, I think the the Cal Enviro screen uh, mapping tools is 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 a very useful tool because it can it can inform people of um you know which which uh which regions are most uh, mostly impacted by air pollution something like that. So so it is a very useful tool to solve the uh, environmental equity issues that is related to climate change and and air pollution. Uh, and for China, I, I remember there there is a very good example in in a city called Hangzhou uh, in the Hebei province. So basically, that city is use they they install um, air quality monitoring uh, equipments in 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 the taxi in, in their taxi. Uh, so 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 as the taxi goes around the cities, they can you know collect the air quality data uh, in real time. Then that provide a very good picture. Um, of how you know how air how air pollutants um uh, where the air pollutant is uh, in in that city. So I think these are two best practices that I can think of by now. Uh, I've also opened this question to to other panelists. Oh, I'll, I'll perhaps start with some thoughts. So I, mean, I think one best practice that uh, we can uh, share, at least from a South Coast perspective, is we've been doing a lot of work on our monitoring data. We have monitors that are required by US EPA, but there's all whole host of other monitoring that we can get and we can access. And so we've been tapping into a lot of the uh, low cost sensor development, um, the purple air monitors, for example, and figuring out ways in which we can kind of incorporate that in our other models so that we can get better resolution of PM 2.5 data and then better understanding of uh, hyper-local environments. So getting down to a very, very uh, fine scales as to what those concentrations are. And I think that's helpful because we know that we get 
regional impacts on PM2.5, as well as ones that are very, very specialized and direct in those uh, local communities, often communities that are already disadvantaged. And so being able to get better resolution on that data, I think is, is really helpful. Yeah, another aspect I can add, I think Sarah presented uh, the quanti the quantitative analysis to translate changes in air pollutant concentrations into health benefits and then the economic gains. I think that is something like methodology-wise is well developed as as uh, you know as can be implemented and built into um any sort of like uh, um policy policy making as assessment like projections that way i think it just connect the dots and and get it into the health endpoints and then even translate into dollars it's just helpful to get the message across to policymakers to appreciate the impact of certain policy the benefits it can bring Excellent. Thank you all for those reflections. So we're coming toward the end of our question and answer portion of the discussion. Um, but I do want to introduce and hear some concluding remarks from Ai Mei, um, who is a program officer of Energy Foundation China in the environmental management um, program there. So I'd love to hear your reflections and perspectives, you know, based on the discussion here today. Hi, um, hello everyone. So you, you can hear me, right? Um, so for first, I want to thank you all for organizing this event and inviting me to this webinar. Um, and I want to apologize that the director Liu Xing was supposed to join this. Uh, meeting and give the closing remark, but he has um, some personal personal affairs to tend to. So um, I'm in replace. And for me, it's um, more of a learning process rather than, I mean, um, giving closing remarks. So um, I, I also want to thank you for all the experts that joined this uh, discussion and, and gave you valuable insights. I think we had an hour of very informative and productive discussions. Uh, focusing on public health AQ and climate change. And we also look at the comparison of jurisdiction systems between China and the US and new progresses made city stories. And it truly gives me a lot of new insights and thoughts. So thank you for that. Mm, and it, it's especially um, when, when I heard the stories of SAQMD, I, I, it, it truly brought me back to the old good memories because I have five years studying and working in the Bay Area. Uh, as an environmental consultant working on the EIRs and some um, actually part of Los Angeles um, project. So yeah, it, it, it really felt familiar learning from this SAQMD experience. Um, and, and from Energy Foundation China. So we are an international um, NGO that aims at supporting China to achieve prosperity and a safe climate through sustainable energy. So um, for Energy Foundation China, we have always set air quality as an important task force. That's because um, as I mentioned earlier today, uh, climate and air pollution share similar sources and processes and they're linked. Uh, and we also look at public health because we believe a people-centered strategy is very crucial to bring the maximum benefits with less cost. And we hope that by implementing a, a, a scientific a health-based AQ standard and a co coordinated strategies for air pollution and carbon control, um, China could achieve triple targets. So first, a world-class air quality, second, carbon neutrality, and third, the e e economic growth. So I think California and South Coast has set up relatively a clear and a very comprehensive AQ uh, policy portfolio with um, measurable policy, uh, public health targets, and that's really impressive. So in China, although um, as Rishin mentioned in uh, the report introduction section that um, public health targets are not yet directly mentioned in the air quality policies, but there, I think there are some good signs so Jennifer just uh, mentioned the newly released National Clean Air Action Plan um, released by the China Ministry of Ecology and Environment. I think um, it has made some progress because at the beginning of the policy, it mentions that the goal of this action plan is to protect human health. And actually that's the first time this is mentioned in the National Action Plan. 
Uh, and the plan also mentioned to start the process of updating the ambient air quality standard. So we hope that public health targets and the uh, health effects will be considered more in this um, standard revising process. And there are also two other key words in the new action plans. One is synergistic carbon control and another is growth. So I think it's also important to look at um, creative co-control strategies and look at the cost effectiveness of the strategies and environmental justice, uh, as Professor Drew just mentioned, to make sure no, no one is left behind and is affordable. So um, uh, I think we recently mentioned the one tool called, uh, I, I can't remember the full name, called Cal Environment Screen. Uh, I, I don't know if I pronounced correct. I think that tool uh, is very promising. It's, looks very helpful to help authorities to assess the cause and benefits associated with the strategies and policies. And Dr. Reese mentioned monitoring. I think that's also important. And um, there are some things that we can um, look at more in the future. So uh, as time is limited, um, we are wrapping up our discussions today. Um, uh, at last, I want to echo one key suggestion from the report that um, it, I think it's really crucial to share lessons learned and good practices between the two countries, especially for officials from AQ departments. And that's because the challenges we face regarding air quality, climate change, and public health are not bounded by borders and they demand collectively action um, that transcends uh, geographical boundaries and political differences. Um, I think it's clear that US has a lot of good uh, experiences to share through decades of works. Uh, and China and cities like Beijing, like Shenzhen, they also have some good stories to tell. So why not we just um, learn from each other? Um, and as uh, we, as us, we Energy Foundation hopes to be a bridge that can link the two countries for knowledge sharing and to achieve the air, health, and climate, and also the e economic targets. And I think that's why we partner with CCCI of UC Berkeley to carry out this project. And we are also up, uh, working with some of our friends in the US, like we, we are now working as Professor Zhu to look at opportunities of trainings and information exchange um, platforms between officials in California and in China. Uh, I think we may have something to do next year. We may host a training program next year to visit US and learn from US and um, hold discussions between us. Um, the, the team may be led by the senior officials from the Ministry of Eco uh, Ecology of Environment. <clears throat> and we may also visit South Coast. So hopefully we can meet you there um, and we can have a great discussion later. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's all from my side. So thank you again for um, joining this event and I hope you have a wonderful night and a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for bringing in the spirit of shared learning and cooperation from both sides. That is very much part of um, the Institute's work as well and um, kind of why we continue to do this work. Um, so thank you to everyone. Thank you to all of our panelists and speakers. Thank you to our audience. Um, as mentioned earlier, this uh, is being recorded and will later be promoted on our website and YouTube channels. Um, and thank you so much for everyone for joining us today. And we hope if you haven't already that you'll take a look at the report that's been discussed today. Thank you. Have a good evening or good morning. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you. you.